thing. I want to begin tonight by asking you a question. What makes for a good story? If any of you have ever watched movies or you've written or you've read books, some of you maybe even have endeavored to write some stories of your own. But what makes for a good story? Well, there is some components of every story that is absolutely necessary. If you want it to be compelling, if you want to draw readers in, there needs to be certain elements as a part of your story. There needs to be a good setting. You have to allow your readers or allow your audience to come into contact with and understand who your main characters are. What is the setting for this story? Beyond this, you need to have some kind of conflict, whether it's some kind of internal conflict that the main character has to wrestle with on their own, or if there's a a common enemy that your main character needs to oppose, there needs to be some form of conflict. Uh, After this, there needs to be some rising action. You know, the, the, the villain or the antagonist in the story is doing what they do, causing the conflict to increase and, and get greater and greater and build and build. And at the same time, you have your main character, your protagonist, who is maybe developing themselves or preparing for a battle, a fight of some kind. And it all leads up to the greatest moment of every story, of every movie, and that is the climax Uh, For many uh, books, for many movies, this could be like a battle scene in any kind of like historic war movie or uh, maybe you are like me and you like the Narnia books. And when I think of a good story, I think of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe and the conflict builds and rises all the way to that final battle scene and you see Aslan pounce upon the white witch and eat her face off right? You have a story. In order to have a good story, you need to have these elements, and hopefully after the climax is reached, there is some kind of resolution for your protagonist. You know, the the villain, the bad guy has been defeated, and now there is peace once again. Well, as we have worked our way through the book of Mark, we come now to chapter 15, and this here is the climax not only of the book of Mark, but it is the climax of all of redemptive history. What we see in Mark 15 is we see the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And everything in the Old Testament, beginning all the way from Genesis chapter 3, when man fell into sin leading all the way up to the Gospels in the New Testament, thousands of years of rising action, all culminating in one amazing moment and one day, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It has all been building to this point, and everything after this point looks back onto it. It is the central point, the central focus of all of Scripture, the central point of really all of history. That's why you and I live in the year 2024, and that's because history is demarcated by the life of Jesus Christ. His death, his crucifixion, marks the center point of all of history. But I think if we're not careful, though the crucifixion is the foundational truth of Christianity, that Jesus died on a cross, if you and I are not careful, this amazing reality that the one who was truly God made himself a man so that he could die in the place of sinners, this amazing reality becomes something that just becomes familiar. What a travesty it would be if the cross of Jesus Christ became common to you. But this is exactly what I think has happened to far too many Christians. The familiarity of the cross has caused them to see it as something that is less than amazing, less than incredible. Less than marvelous and miraculous, the cross of Christ is what is the foundation for our hope. And so as we look at Mark chapter 15 tonight, I want us to see two precious truths that lead us and prompt us to two powerful responses. And the way we're going to begin tonight is by reading the entire chapter, because I don't think we do that nearly enough, and I want you to see all the details of this most amazing day, this day of Jesus' crucifixion. So if you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. It says, And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes, and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. 
And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him, and they had mocked him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they, compelling a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who is coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who was stood facing him saw that in the way he which he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking, women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have died already. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary, Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Let's pray. 
Father, it is a sobering scene to read of the death and the crucifixion of Jesus. The picture of one hanging on a cross as though accursed for those who truly are accursed. Father, it's my prayer that you would give us all a fresh appreciation and wonder at who you are through Mark's account of Jesus' crucifixion. May each one understand that when we read of Jesus' torture, his scourging, his beating, his execution, he is doing so in order to take our place. Jesus is doing what we could not do for ourselves. God, help us to be in amazement. God, help us to be in wonder at who Christ is. As we look at the tragic and awful scene that occurred in our Savior's life, let us consider that it was all for love's sake. I pray that in light of this truth, we would live for you. Focus our hearts and minds on your word this evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I told you that the purpose of tonight is to highlight two truths that prompt us to two responses. And as we look at Mark 15, the first truth I want you to understand is that Christ went to the cross sovereignly. That word sovereignly, maybe it's unfamiliar to some of you. It has the connotation of a king's right to rule his own country. And we understand that as God, as the creator of all the world, has the right to rule over all of his creation. The word sovereign also carries with it the idea of complete and total control. And this is what we want to highlight in Mark 15, is that Jesus went to the cross with total and complete control. It was always the plan of God before the foundation of the world that the Son would die in the place of sinners. Jesus, even in his own instruction to the disciples in Mark chapter 8, first tells them in Mark 8.31 that he would be going to Jerusalem, delivered over to the chief priests to be crucified. Again, in chapter 9, verse 30 and 31, Jesus tells his disciples once again, a second time, he is going to Jerusalem for the purpose of being crucified. And again, in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 and 30 through 34, Jesus once again tells his disciples, we are going to Jerusalem for the purpose that I would be delivered over and crucified for the sin of the people. Jesus, as he makes his way to Jerusalem, goes knowing full well what he is going toward. In Mark chapter 11, we see the triumphal entry, and Jesus is not deceived or misled for one moment. He knows that despite the momentary praise he is receiving from the people of Israel, that within a week's time, he will be naked on a cross, dying because they desire to see him crucified. It was always the plan of God for Jesus to go to the cross. We even see this in later on in the book of Acts as Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. He says that the one, Jesus, this man who you delivered, was according to the predetermined plan of God. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, we know that we have been chosen in Christ when before the foundation of the world. In eternity past, it was the desire of the triune God, God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, that the Son would be made incarnate, made flesh, and that he would live a perfect, sinless life, and that he would go and die on the cross as a substitutionary, atoning sacrifice in the place of those who could not save themselves. This was always the plan of God. No one forced Jesus to go to the cross. Jesus says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down willingly. No one got Jesus by surprise as we see Jesus in the garden. He brings his disciples to the place where Judas is going to meet them. He knows exactly where he's going to be betrayed, by whom he will be betrayed. Christ willingly and intentionally went to the cross. 
When he was given opportunity to flee, when he was given opportunity to make an answer for himself, we see him being absolutely quiet. Jesus is not trying to wiggle his way out of this. In the garden, he prays the the prayer of a man who has a human nature. It's a demonstration of the, the true humanity of Jesus when he says, Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. But his next words are telling of his divine nature. Not my will, but yours be done. Christ went to the cross willingly, intentionally. He laid down his life as a free will offering. Christ went to the cross sovereignly. We see this even in the fact that on the day of Jesus' crucifixion, there are 27 prophecies of the Old Testament that are all fulfilled in one 24-hour period. I would give you a sampling tonight. That Jesus didn't speak before his accusers. We see that in Mark, verses, Mark 15, verses 1 to 5. It's a fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 7. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. That Jesus was beaten and scourged. We see that in verses 16 to verse 20 of Mark chapter 15. It's a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, and the 52, verse 14. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance and his form beyond that of the children of humankind. That Jesus' hands and feet were pierced in verse 24 is a fulfillment of Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs encompass me, a, a company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. That his garments were divided by the soldiers. We see that in verse 24. It's a fulfillment of Psalm 22, verse 18. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Detail after detail after detail. What we see in Mark's account of the crucifixion of Jesus, and what we see in all of the accounts of the crucifixion, is that there was not even the smallest detail, there was not even the smallest Uh, part of the day that was outside of the sovereign control of God. Recognize this, dear friends, that Jesus Christ did not go to the cross as a victim. He went to the cross to proclaim victory and to gain victory over sin and death for you and for me. He went willingly. He went with a purpose. And when we think about all that Jesus went through on that day, the beating, the scourging, the, the, the The pains that come along with an execution by crucifixion. The most excruciating way that one can suffer execution. The the public embarrassment of being set out at the beginning, at at the very front of the city of Jerusalem, where all could see him, stripped of his clothes and placed hanging on a cross as an example of do not deny and do not defy the Roman Empire, Jesus's the the accusation against Jesus was that he is the king of the Jews. It was as if Jesus was being crucified for being an insurrectionist, for trying to rally up people against the Roman government, and he is placed on a cross as an example of, do not be this man. This is what happens to all who try to defy the Roman government. The shame of being on a cross, the pain that he experienced, it was all intentional. It was all according to the predetermined plan of God. Recognize this, friends. Jesus went to the cross sovereignly. But the second truth I want us to understand from Mark chapter 15 is that the cross was absolutely necessary. The cross was absolutely necessary. If you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, we read of atonement. In Hebrews chapter 10, turn there, and we're going to read some verses from Hebrews chapter 10 so that you get a picture of what's truly taking place at the crucifixion. Hebrews 10 paints the picture of atonement, and if we flash back all the way to the book of Leviticus, we have the the day of atonement being set up for the people of Israel. And this is that once a year, the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, and he would make a sacrifice on behalf of the people of Israel. One goat would be slaughtered, and its, its blood sprinkled upon the mercy seat, one goat would be, have its, uh, the sin of the people confessed on its head and sent away into the wilderness. That's where we get the term scapegoat from. And this once a year day of atonement was performed by a priest every year for all the history of Israel while they 
observed it. And so as we come to Hebrews chapter 10, keep this in mind. For since the law has but a shadow of good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices... The every year atonement. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year. For it is impossible by the blood of bulls and goats to, make, uh, to take away sin. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you take no pleasure, Then I said, Behold, I have come to do the will, your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, there are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. This is speaking about Jesus. And it says there, He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that, he will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Pay special attention to verses 11 through 14. Every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The cross of Jesus Christ was absolutely necessary because of the reality of sin. Everyone who has ever been born has the same exact problem, and it's the problem that they are born with a sin nature. That means as soon as you are born, before you ever commit your first sin, you already possess a sin nature. And your sin separates you from God and makes you worthy only of the punishment for sin, which Romans 6.23 tells us is death. And so you come into this world with the problem of a sin nature, deserving of death and separated from God. And as we look at the history of the people of Israel, the the means by which they were able to have access to God was through sacrificing animals in a sacrificial system to make atonement for their sin. But as Hebrews tells us, it was never able to take away sin. And think of the, the job of a priest was truly the job of a butcher. He would constantly be killing animals all day long and spreading their blood upon the mercy seat on behalf of those who would come to make sacrifices for their sin. But the sacrifices never ended because the blood of bulls and goats and sheep cannot take away your sin. Even if we think about the, 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 rec- the requirements for what a sacrifice had to be, it was a very specific animal. It was a sheep or a goat, and it had to be without blemish. It had to be a perfect, spotless lamb. And what we recognize looking back on this is that it was emblematic, it was a foreshadowing of the perfect, unblemished, spotless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. But when Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for you and for I, his death wasn't just a death for dying's sake. He was dying as a substitution for you and for me. The sin that you and I commit that makes us worthy of death, Jesus sacrificed himself as a substitutionary sacrifice. He died in our place. The death that you and I deserve, Jesus died in our place. This is what we call atonement. He is making atonement for sin. Even if we just go one chapter back from Hebrews 10 to to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says that without the spilling of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so Jesus' death on the cross, what we understand about it is it was absolutely necessary because you and I need to have our sins paid for. And it's either paid by you for all of eternity in a place called hell, or it was paid for once for all on the cross by Jesus Christ. There are only those two options. So not only is Jesus an atonement, but he's also a substitution. 
The 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might be the righteousness of Christ in him. What Jesus' death accomplished is that when he was on the cross, all of your sin, past, present, and future that you will ever commit, was paid for by Christ in a single six-hour period on the cross. And God treated his only beloved son as if he had committed every sin that you and I had ever committed. Jesus paid for those sins on the cross. It was not as though Jesus actually had sin. Jesus had no sin. He was perfect and sinless. But it was as though God was treating him as if he had committed all the sins and was pouring out his wrath on him as he would pour out his wrath on your sin. And what you would have to pay for in all of eternity, Christ paid for in six hours upon the cross. So recognize, friends, the cross was absolutely necessary. There was no other way to have sin paid for but by the, the, the crucifixion, by the death of the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. It was necessary for atonement's sake, but it was also necessary for reconciliation's sake. That word reconciliation, it's a big word, but you can think about it in simple terms. You and your friend have a, a conflict, something that divides the two of you. And when you reconcile it is you're coming back and, and rekindling that friendship and that closeness of the relationship that you had before. What Jesus' death does is he reconciles man's relationship to God. We understand that God is a holy God. Uh, he is a just God that must punish sin. And so your sin separates you from God, but what Jesus' death does is it pays the price for your sin, but it doesn't just put you on level ground. It now treats you as though you were righteous, and so your relationship with God is restored. It's reconciled. This is shown and pictured in verse 38 of our text tonight. In verse 38, after Jesus breathes his last, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And this veil that was at the beginning, uh, at the forefront of the holies of holies, represented the separation, a physical and visible separation of God and man. You cannot approach me, and I will not approach you. Once a year, the high priest, but after sanctifying himself and purifying himself, was able to make one sacrifice once a year. At Jesus' death, what he does is the veil tears, and it's even important that you recognize it tears from top to bottom. The veil represents a separation between God and man, but in the person Jesus Christ, in the truly God, truly man Jesus Christ, we have our ability to now have a restored and reconciled relationship to God, but only through Jesus. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the only means for you and I to have a reconciled and restored relationship to God because he takes upon himself our sin, and he gives us his own righteousness. I'm reminded of the words of the hymn, His Robes for Mine. And in the final verse of that song, the words go, He as though I, or I as though he, no, it's, I had it right the first time. He as though I, accursed and left alone. I as though he, embraced and welcomed home. Do you understand that in the cross, Jesus was treated as if he were you with your sin and your wickedness, and you are now treated with his righteousness and his perfect spotlessness? So that when you, on, on the day of judgment, when you stand before God, he doesn't look at you with your sinfulness, but he only sees the righteousness of his son. This was what, accompli what was accomplished for you on the cross by Jesus. So recognize, friends, that the cross was absolutely necessary. It accomplished atonement for your sin, and it brought you into a reconciled relationship to God. I said there were two truths that prompt us to two responses. And so our first response to what we've heard, to the cross of Jesus Christ, what does this prompt us to do? The first response is that you would respond in repentance over your sin. The first right response to the gospel, the first right response to this awful and tragic event, really, in the life of Jesus, the first, reckon, the first right response is for us to respond with a heart of repentance. Now, the word repentance is broken down into two different words that literally means mind and change. You have a change of mind. That is what it means to repent. 
And so what it means to repent in terms of relating to the cross of Christ is that you are, you are changing your mind in, in relation to your sin. So that once before you were obedient to your flesh, you were obedient to your sin and all the things that displeased God, but you change your mind and now you've forsaken those things and you want to live a life of obedience and righteousness to the law of God. You want to be obedient to Christ. This is what it means to repent And we have the sureness of the truth of God. Turning your Bibles quickly to Romans chapter 10. And in verses 9 and 10 of Romans chapter 10, we have an amazing promise that comes from God. It says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. This is the only truly right response to the cross of Jesus Christ. That you would confess Jesus as Lord. And what that implies is that you are now no longer Lord. You are not the one in charge of your own life. You're not the one making decisions for yourself. But you are submitting yourself totally and completely to the submission of Jesus Christ and what he demands of you and his word. He is Lord. And beyond this, and that's emblematic, obviously, of repentance. Repenting of uh, changing my mind from I am in charge of my life. I'm in charge of my decisions. No longer. And now it is Christ. I am submitting to his lordship. I'm submitting to his word. I'm submitting to obedience to him. It's true repentance. But beyond this, there is also the confession with the mouth. The word confession is the word homologeto. It's a Greek word, and it also has two words that make it up. And it's the word say the same thing. You are saying the same thing about your sin as God says about your sin. It is now no longer something that is desirable. It is now no longer something that you want to continue in. It is now no longer something that you want to live your life by. But you are saying the same thing about your sin as God says about your sin. And what does God say about your sin? That it breaks my law. And truly that it is the reason that Christ went to the cross. Understand this, friends. Some of you take your sin far too lightly. You think your sin is a trivial thing, but it was your sin that made the cross of Jesus Christ necessary. It was your sin that caused him to go through the pain and the suffering, the execution and the shame and the embarrassment. It was all because of your sin. How lightly do you treat your sin? How often do you mentally recognize that it was this sin that caused the cross of Jesus Christ to be necessary? Or after sinning, do you think nothing much of it and continue on with your day? Not even recognizing the amazing truth that your sin was paid for by Jesus on the cross. The only right response to the cross of Jesus Christ is repentance. This is true for the unbeliever. This is also true for the believer. Because there should be a regular, habitual, and consistent practice of repenting of our sin, even for those who already are saved. For those who belong to Christ, there should be a continued and strong and growing desire to constantly be repenting of our sin and all that dishonors God. Not because we're fearful of God, but because we truly love him and we recognize the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. And so response number one is that we respond in repentance over our sin. The second response is that we would respond by living a life of gratitude. Respond by living a life of gratitude. How often do you think of the cross? How often do you think of the torture, and the beating, the shame that Christ endured on your behalf? How often do you meditate upon the amazing reality that God would demonstrate his love in such an amazing way that he would die in your place. Romans 5.8 says that even while you were the enemy of God, he demonstrated his love for you through Jesus. I mean, I've got a wife and I've got a son on the way and I know that I would give my life for them in a second. Why? Because I love them. 
I cherish and value their lives more importantly than my own. But you know who I probably wouldn't die for? Some stranger halfway across the world. Because I don't know them. I have no idea who they are. I, I don't know anything about them. And as a human, it's hard for me to really emotionally desire to give up my own life for that of a stranger. But even further than that of a stranger, Christ died for those who were currently and presently his enemies. Those who wanted nothing to do with him. Those who were currently and presently sinning against him, rebelling against him, desiring nothing to do with him, and desiring to do the opposite of everything that he desired, Christ died for those people. Not just those who preciously loved him, not even for that of someone who's kind of neutral and a stranger, but for those who were actively the enemies of God. This, these are those for whom Christ died. I don't think you and I treat our sin with enough weight. I think we think of it too lightly. As we read Mark 15, I'm moved to tears often. Because in my own life, I constantly fail and sin against God. And it was my Savior's death who gave me life. Friends, do you take your sin seriously? Do you repent of it regularly? Do you confess it before God because you know it was that sin that caused the, cry, the, the cross to be necessary? You should. And as we live a life of gratitude, what does that look like? What does it look like to live a life of gratitude? Well, imagine for me that you're driving home and or so you're, you're walking in the street and someone's driving and they're maybe even just driving home and you're crossing the street and that car is about to hit you because they don't see you and some stranger walks up and throws his arms around you and brings you out of the direction of that car. He saves your life. No doubt you would be for the rest of your life grateful for that person and what they did for you. It's no different than our gratitude for Christ, only it's far greater because Christ didn't just save us, he sacrificed himself in our stead. And so the New Testament is full of commands for us to live this life of gratitude. Romans 12:1, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What Paul's saying in Romans 12 is that it's expected that you should live as a sacrifice for Christ since he died as a sacrifice for you. We should be willing to, at any moment, be really re ready to sacrifice our wants, our desires for those of Christ's. That we would be willing in every area and every facet of our life to give up what we want and what we desire if it is in contradiction to the word of God. It's not out of slavery. It's not out of obligation. It's out of love and gratitude. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The body that you still presently live in, you have this life for, what, 60, 70, 80, maybe more years? As long as you are in this body, in this flesh, recognize that you have been purchased for a price. The price was the blood of Jesus. And as the result of that, you do not belong to yourself. Even listen to the words of Paul in Galatians chapter 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As long as you live this life, your life does not belong to you. It belongs to God. And the reasonable worship, the reasonable service that you can offer God as a result of Him saving you for all of eternity is for this temporary and short and fleeting life you can serve Him with all of your energy. You could not do any better than to give up of your life in all of your years than in serving God, this, the God who saved you for all of eternity. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, For me to live is Christ. 
to die is gain. If I am to live on in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. As long as we live, our lives are to be lived for Christ, not ourselves. Living in this flesh ought to be used solely for the desire and the striving after fruitful labor. Fruitful labor, what does that mean? That means producing fruit for the kingdom of God. That means making all of your efforts, all of your energies, not being set on the temporary things, the things that are passing away, but on the things of the kingdom of God which will last for all of eternity. As long as you live, your life should be lived for Christ. Or even think of this principle from 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You have been given new life in Christ. You are a new creation. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, giving you eternal life. As long as you live this life, you are something different. You are not the same as what you were before. And so you ought not live the way you lived before you knew Christ. You ought not live the same way that you lived before Christ saved you. Before you recognized the precious truth of the gospel, that Christ died on the behalf of sinners, and that his death was a substitutionary death. He took your place. He put upon himself your sins so that you could have his righteousness. And by placing your faith in Jesus as the only means of salvation, not your works, and not your good things that you do, It is only the blood of Jesus, his death, that can save you. By placing your faith in his death and by repenting of your sin and all that dishonors God and changing your mind so now you are no longer obeying your flesh, but you're obeying the scriptures, you're obeying Christ, you can have access to the salvation that comes from the cross of Christ. The crucifixion is a horrific scene. It is no doubt the the greatest evil that was ever committed in all of human history. And yet it was the design of God that his beloved son would die so that those who were once his enemies could be made his friends, so that those who were once spiritually dead can have eternal life. What will you do? What will you do after hearing this? Many of you have heard this plenty of times before, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. I pray that you would hear it afresh tonight. I pray that this wouldn't be a familiar message, but that this would be one that strikes to the heart, that brings you to a place of understanding the the seriousness and the weight of your sin. The only right response is to repent of your sin and to live a life of gratitude. That's my call for you tonight, because that's what Scripture calls you to do. Will you obey? Father, I thank you for the cross of Christ. For his blood shed on our behalf. Christ in his death paid the price of sin, which is death, on all our behalves. God, it's my prayer that there wouldn't be a student here tonight who would leave here without repenting of their sin and trusting wholly and completely in the death and resurrection of Jesus is the only means of their salvation. God, your word is powerful. You say it will not return void. So I pray that it would do the work that it promises to do. I pray for the student here tonight who has a relationship with you, has been saved, has been made new. That they would live a life of gratitude demonstrated by willingness to sacrifice anything if it's in contradiction of your word. That they would desire for all their days to be pleasing to you and producing fruit. It's the least we can do for the great sacrifice that you made on our behalf. God, we're thankful for the cross. That in it we have the atonement of our sin and reconciliation with God. I pray that we would ponder this anew. That we would meditate upon these truths. And that we would respond the way your scripture calls us to. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys.